But Zacchaeus, he heard, must have heard of Christ because he wanted to see him. And he climbs up on a tree because he was of little stature. Mm. This was a man who wanted to see Christ and no doubt wanted to have a conversation with him. <coughs> well, what <coughs> happened? I get my uh, reference now, 19 verse uh, Verse 2 to 10. Chief among the publicans, verse 2, he was rich and sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not because of the press, that's the amount of people around. He ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus! Make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. Ooh, a publican, the chief of them. This man sitteth with publicans and sinners, the old self-righteous people said. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. Mm. You see, there was a work done already in this man. And when they saw, they all murmured, saying that he has gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. I'm glad that he does and did. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Lord, behold, half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore to him fourfold. That's the fruit of repentance there. Reparation is a fruit of repentance. If we've defrauded anybody, then when we're converted, we should make reparation. This man was repentant. He showed the evidence of repentance. What did Christ say? This day is salvation come to hit this house for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. This publican, chief of them, Salvation was come to his house. Christ didn't need to preach to him the law, but no doubt he had heard it preached somewhere along the line. And he wanted to see Christ, and he saw him, see him joyfully, and give every evidence that he was truly born of the Spirit. And that's another example of the way that the Lord dealt. Then there's a rich young ruler, Mark 10, 17 to 27. Mm. Years ago I heard a very good sermon by Al Martin mm. on this particular occurrence. This rich young ruler was an upright young man He wasn't a profligate. He was outwardly righteous. But he obviously knew there was something not right. The Spirit was at work. That's the Spirit. When he has come, the Spirit, what does he do? He convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That's the work. That's the if you like, the office of the Holy Spirit on the earth, as well as taking of the things of Christ and showing them unto us. And so he begins by saying, as he, he, he came, he said, Good Master, what good thing? He actually kneeled down to him. He said, What good thing will, must I do to it that I may inherit eternal life? Well, obviously he belonged to the Pharisees, as it were, and thought salvation was by works, hence his question. And Christ immediately pulls them up. He says, there's none good but God. Well, what was he wanting to do there? Well, he was wanting him to realize, you're not as good as you think you are. Only God is good. And why call you me good? Mm. 
Well, of course, he wanted them to know there was something different about himself as well, but what does he do then? He preaches the law. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, I said unto him, Master, all these I have observed from my youth. And Jesus beholding him loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest. Before we go any further, the Lord looked on him and he loved him, but he didn't tell him. Because he loved him, he preached the law to him. Mm. Yeah? Mm. And then, he didn't contradict him that he hadn't kept the law in the sins that he, or the mm. commandments that he mentioned. He said, one thing you lack. You've come to me, you've got a need. You know there's something not right. Now I'm going to put the finger. And he says, because he loved him. He told him the truth of what was his situation. He said, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, give it to the poor, thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieving, for he had great possessions. Did Christ run after him? No. Did he say, now hold on a minute, get him in the inquiry room and work him over? <laughs> no. He left him to the Holy Spirit because he had delivered the word to him. He had exposed his sin. Let the Holy Spirit do his work. It's the problem, you see. Manhandling, I call it. Hmm. Now, because it says Jesus loved him, I believe he was converted to the Calvinist, of course, but we won't argue about that. But that's a perfect example. Self-righteous. And he was a righteous young man by the sound of things. Christ didn't pull him up and say, well, you're not as good as you think. Well, in effect, he said it. He didn't contradict him all this. Uh, these are kept from my ears up, but he said one thing he lacked great riches. The disciples said, how hardly shall a rich man enter the kingdom of heaven? It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of an eagle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. They were astonished when Christ said this. Who then can be saved? And Jesus looking on them said, with men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. And let me tell you something, only God in Christ by the Spirit can save. It's impossible with man to save anybody. Man can't save himself. We can't save anybody. But we can tell them the way of salvation. But don't try and do the work of the Holy Spirit. Deliver the truth. Expose the sin. And leave it with the Lord. Let us not put our grubby hands on the Ark of the Covenant. Mm. So there was an example. Expose the sin by the preaching of the law. By the law is the knowledge of sin. And he went away sorrowing. And Christ didn't run after him with a handkerchief or anything else. He just left him to the Lord. To the Spirit of God to deal with him. Now what about the apostles? Now the great commission that was given them, which I mentioned to you, was that repentance should be preached in all nations. Now I love reading Acts, Acts chapter 2. Because old bungling Peter, mm. cowardly Peter, getting it always wrong Peter, is now a transformed man by the power of the Holy Spirit. Can this be Peter? The same Peter? Because now 
He's brave. He's in the lion's den. There were a lot of people there who no doubt were involved in the crucifixion of Christ. And no doubt they would be still incensed against the memory of him even. And Peter stands up and he's able to tell them what's happening with the outpouring of the Spirit, quoting the Old Testament Joel, of course. And then he goes on, verse 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God has raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad, and moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life, thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you, the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God hath sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into heaven, but he hath saith, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly, that God hath made this same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. <coughs> that was a very dangerous thing for him to say in that company, but he said it. Because now he's no longer cowardly Peter, he's full of the Holy Ghost. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, there it is again, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. And those that gladly received the word were baptized in about 3,000 souls. There's no God loves you there. But it was the love of God speaking through them that challenged them over what they'd done. And then, in the uh, following chapter, again, <coughs> after that the man was healed at the gate, beautiful, and they wanted really to honor Peter and so on, Verse 12, when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? And why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our power or holiness we had made this man to walk? The God of Abraham and of Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up, and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God has raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, which ye see and know. Yea, 
The faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Now, brother, now what that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. But these things which God before had showed by the mouth of all the prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heavens must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. No compromise there. He exposed their sin. He spoke against it on no uncertain terms and told them they must repent. That's true preaching. Every time we preach in the open air, we should preach against sin and call upon them to repent and remind them without repentance there is no forgiveness. Amen. Whether they hear or whether they forbear, we are to preach it. That's the example of the Apostle, the example of Christ. Now let's get back to Matthew and the wheat and the tares. Because I believe that this love gospel is sowing tares. Because it's, it's sort of, it's not even half the gospel. But it's, it's the gospel without <coughs> repentance, which really is no gospel. But people, especially if you lay on entertainment for them in the churches, uh, you know, well, I think a religion without repentance that you can carry on, maybe not in your most gross sins, but your ordinary sins, be very popular. You see, our problem is our sin. That's what separates us from God. That's why Christ came to deal with it. That's why he suffered the torment of the damned when the wrath of God was poured on him in order that God could justify, <laughs> the, justify the ungodly. Without it, we're lost. Amen. That's the problem. That's the root cause. That is what must be dealt with. But if you preach a gospel which is no gospel, but has the sort of appearance of it where there's no repentance, there can be a growth. And it might have a superficial look of the real thing. You see, modernism won't do that. Rationalism won't do that because it is so far removed from the Bible teaching, then they're not going to rear up anything similar. You know, tears as such, they're just going to bring up wings and thistles and so on, if you see what I mean. But when you get some, you see, a counterfeit is as good as it is near to the genuine without being the genuine. Mm. So they talk about being born again. They talk about being evangelical. We, we're not talking here about the generality, you know, of the Reformation churches that are apostate and full of all sorts of nonsense and so on. These are people claiming to be evangelical. And these are the ones that are getting in my face and others. Now, two weeks ago, I had a woman in my face. She was like a Spandau machine gun, spitting out <laughs> the words that fast, I couldn't get a word in. Because I always say, what does the scripture say? Amen. 
But at the same time, one of our helpers handing out tracts, an unconverted man had been listening to me preaching and said, I agree with everything that man said and asked for a tract because I was preaching about the state of the nation. Here, an evangelical in my face. And here's an unconverted man who could see more clearly than this one. Now, I don't think I need to give you any more examples from the Bible because you can search it from, Mark, uh, from Matthew to Revelation and see if what I say is correct. It's the love of God that causes us to preach the truth. We desire the salvation of sinners. They can't be saved unless they understand what sin is and have from the word of God revealed what it is. The Sermon on the Mount is really a elucidation of the Ten Commandments because it applies to, you know, how, how you think and what you think and what you see and so on. We are not doing sinners any favors by softening the message. And without repentance, let's repeat it, there can be no forgiveness. One of the scriptures we have is God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. There it is. The highest authority in the universe, as I tell them, commands you to repent and me to repent. And we animated dust, there the fire. But that's how it is. Now, to close, I'll give you an example. We've just got a couple coming in to the church who have been going around visiting other meetings and we weren't happy and then when these, some of these people heard that they were coming to Zion one had sent a mess text message they said just a small warning not to take on board the extreme views of the Zionist church Zion Tavern, well not Zionist but anyway <laughs> They seem to spread so much negativity in the city, especially during Pride Week. Amen. <laughs> this is an evangelical supposedly speaking. God's total acceptance and love for his creation seems to be misinterpreted. Another one. They cause mayhem for people visiting the city. Preaching fire and brimstone is not the way to show Jesus' love. This is the epitome of the love gospel. Now, you will notice in the parable of the wheat and the tares that the servants didn't realize that the tares had been sown until it was the time of the fruit. Verse 26. Then when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then <laughs> appeared the tares also. Bring forth fruit need for repentance. Tears can't do that. And I understand, I can speak about wheat having been brought up on a farm. When the wheat is ripe, full of grain, the head bows. The tares don't, they remain upright because the seed in it is very light. He didn't see, the servants didn't realize what had happened when they saw there wasn't fruit. Well, what are we to do? Well, we can't root them up because we could do all damage, but what we can do is preach the truth to them and they'll either get converted or run away. But isn't that significant? An enemy has done this. The love gospel, the enemy is behind it. Because it's not the gospel. It's an aspect of it. But without repentance, it's vain. It's dangerous. You think now, I remember years ago looking up New York Crusade, Billy Graham and so on. And there have been multiple thousands of conversions, supposedly. 
And two years later, they did a follow-up to see how many were still attending the place of worship. And apparently, it was around 2%. And that was now taken into consideration those who were already attending a place of worship. I don't know how much you know about Billy Graham's compromise, but before the beginning of the Anfield 84 crusade, headline in the Roman Catholic pictorial, Can Billy Bring Us Back 4,000 Lapsed? Because when people from Roman Catholic backgrounds went forward and put their hands up and were processed, they were handed over to the priests and nuns. Mm -hmm. And you can go on YouTube and you'll find right there when Billy Graham has been interviewed by Robert Schuller, who's a bit of a reprobate. <laughs> And Ralph Schuller said to him, so uh, you believe only, you know, those who've heard of Jesus are saved. Oh, no, says Graham. Mm -hmm. He says, I believe that, you know, heathen people who've lived a, a good life according to the light that they have will be in heaven. He said, there'll be people in heaven who never heard of Jesus. And how many of God's people think that Billy Graham is the epitome of evangelical preacher. And his son, Franklin Graham, good speaker, but he's in with Rome, he's in with the Charismatics. And in Cardiff, the, the blurb for Cardiff last year was, well, what they call these crusades is God loves you crusade. That's what they're calling them. Mm -hmm. And the one for Cardiff was last year said, come and have an enjoyable evening. That's not the object that I would have in mind for sinners <laughs> in an evangelical campaign. I'd hoped they'd have a horrible evening, but that it might end. <laughs> but that it might end, it might end in joy. Yeah. But the Spirit would convict them. Mm -hmm. If you want to encourage yourself, well, I'll read any book on genuine revival. It'll cheer your heart. But read the Calvinistic revival in Wales. Daniel Rowlands was preaching the law and he didn't even know the way of salvation himself. And the people were in such convictions they were well nigh having mental breakdowns. And Mr. Pugh, the Presbyterian, I'm not raising the fact that Presbyterian is here, so don't <laughs> misunderstand it, said this, Mr. Rowlands, you need to preach Christ. Roland says, well, I don't rightly know it myself. He says, you preach it, you'll soon know it. And he did. And these people were like hinds left loose. Imagine Calvin is sleeping for joy because they've been under such awful conviction and no remedy because he wasn't preaching Christ. That's the, yeah. that's the wrong way to go. Oh, if you only preach the law and don't tell them of the way of salvation in general terms, well, you're not preach the gospel either. We tell them what Christ has done for sinners such as they, that whoever repents and believes will be converted. Now we don't have to go into all the five points of Calvinism and all that to the unconverted, that can come afterwards. You preach the gospel, you preach the, tr the problem and the remedy. And God uses us human beings. He doesn't have to, but he does. Mm. And how few there are that are doing it. Mm. It's no good waiting for the sinners to come into the church. Praise God if they did. Go out into the highways and by. Go, said Christ, into all the world. Mm. Behold, he says, I send you forth as lambs in the midst of wolves. Why were the heathen raging? They won't get raging if you say, well, God loves you. I actually heard somebody preaching this in the open air, and these two young men said, oh, I'm all right then. Huh. Yeah. The heathen rage when you tackle them over their sin. They won't rage when you tell them God loves you. They might say a oh, fairy tale or something, but they won't get really angry with you. But you put the finger on the sin, 
and they will get angry. But the problem I have is even jellyfish are getting more angry than the ungodly. There's something rotten. And it was only recently it came to me, and I'm sure it was the Lord, not to say that's it right, but you're making a way. This, this, this is the test. An enemy has done this. He's sowing the counterfeits in the evangelical constituency that won't stand for anything. And they always say, if you don't stand for anything, you'll fall for everything. <laughs> well then, here's the worst thing I heard, and this I'm finished. This is a pastor in a church that belongs to the New Frontier charismatic movement. And he was preaching apparently on the Lord calling Lazarus out of the tomb. You know, where he says, Lazarus, come forth. But he used the modern thing, Lazarus, come out. And he says, that's what Jesus is saying to the homosexual. Yeah. Oh, wow. And he said, if he was around today, he'd be in the LGBT parade. <laughs> Something wrong, Father. And I believe with all my heart, it's the love gospel. 